we are all very human and fallible, and yet we live in a society that rewards pretending we're not fallible, or the range of acceptable fallibility is narrow. We are constantly comparing our insides to other people's outsides and feeling inadequate and guilty, even ashamed. Trying to blend in means parts of ourselves must disappear, and we must then live in fear that we will be found out. Here, together, we will create a space where we can laugh, cry, and carry our suffering and hurts lightly. In the service of being deeply human. This is Life's Dirty Little Secrets. Hello, I'm Chris McCurry, and this is Life's Dirty Little Secrets. And I'm Emma Waddington, and today we have the incredible Stephen Batchelor. Stephen Batchelor is a Scottish Buddhist author and teacher. He's known for his writing on Buddhist subjects and leadership of meditation retreats worldwide. A noted proponent of agnostic and secular Buddhism. And incredibly, at the age of 17, he traveled to India, which took you six months, interested in the big questions like the meaning of life. And he found himself amongst monks for many, many years, and then came back to author numerous books. I think it's eight in total. Is that right? How many books have you written? I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I lose count, but uh, something yeah. al- something about like that. Yeah, 10 or so maybe. I don't yes, know. incredible, incredible amounts of, of writing, including the very well-known bestseller, Buddhism Without Beliefs, which was my introduction to your work, and Living with the Devil. And our paths have crossed a couple of times. About 20 mm-hmm. years ago, actually, I uh, came across your work when one of our previous guests, Martin Wilk, actually gave me your book, Living with the Devil, as I was finishing my PhD. And he told me, you must go and see Stephen Batchelor at Gaia House. Uh-huh. You must do one of the retreats with him. And I couldn't get into one of the retreats with you, but I went on to another retreat. I can't remember who led it. Helen, a yoga. Yeah. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's it. That's it. It was a seven day silent retreat, which was incredibly challenging for me at the time. And then I remember seeing you speak in Waterloo a couple of years afterwards in a really small gathering and being really struck. By. At the time, I was introduced to the model that I now use, acceptance and commitment therapy. And it was, I was struck by the similarities in mm. the work that you were talking about in your sort of more secular Buddhist text about really living with our inner demons. And I remember at the time, I was having quite a difficult time with my own inner demons and being able to read about in your text, this idea that, you know, being able to make space for being open to versus this battle and turmoil that we can have with our insides was, yeah, really liberating. So, yeah, so today I'm really delighted to be speaking to you finally in person after having wanted to be at your retreat 20 odd years ago. And really to talk about this internal struggle. Why is it that As humans, we find it so hard to hold both the good and the bad inside of us. So welcome. Well, thank you very much, Emma and Chris. I'll do what I can to try to shed some light on this matter. But what we're really facing in many ways is the the fundamental conundrum of being human. This is is the, the question of good and evil. I think that human beings ever since they started to think have struggled with and uh, whether you go back in the in the asian traditions back to the buddha back to the vedas back to shuang and the ancient chinese or whether you do the same in the western tradition going back through christianity and judaism or returning to socrates and the greeks all of these people and i consider them to be far more intelligent than me have have tried to get to grips with this you know fundamental ethical conundrum of how to lead a good life and i guess one of the biggest paradoxes is that everybody wants to be good 
everybody likes to think that what they do is good. And yet we find sometimes it completely irresistible to do the very opposite of what we aspire for. We want to be kind, and the next thing we know, we're talking to our partner and we're being anything but kind. Mm. And we find ourselves so easily overwhelmed by, by thoughts, by emotions, by habit patterns, by grudges, by anger, by all of these powerful forces that just rise up unbidden within us. And we find ourselves saying and doing things that we, uh, we subsequently you know, deeply regret. We don't, you know, we don't hurt people or whatever. So I've been, I've been grappling with this, not only when I wrote the book, Living with the Devil, which tries to take this topic head on, a book which was published now, actually 20 years ago, it was published in 2004. Yeah. And yeah. I find myself now, in fact, this morning, <laughs> for the last three years since COVID, I'm now also working on another book, which is addressing very much the same themes about uh, what I call an ethics of uncertainty. And I'm trying to frame this dilemma really now in terms of how, you know, we, we, we are caught in a sense of being in a world that we don't fully understand. When we make ethical decisions, when we have to, you know, make a difficult choice that's going to affect other people, we can never be sure of the outcome. We can think mm. about what we would we would be the best way to respond, the best thing to say, the best thing to do. Um, and no matter how much we think about it, we can never foresee exactly what consequences it will have. And so we can, as a word, I think it's a Bob Dylan song says, you know, we try to do our best, but we end up making things a whole matter a whole lot worse. <laughs> so we we. So we have a, a double problem. We have, on the one hand, these unbidden urges and ideas that we can't resist sort of blurting out and causing pain. Mm. And even when we have, you know, time to reflect and contemplate and sit and meditate about how to resolve a particular issue, we do our best and end up making things worse. Mm. So good and evil, I think, are issues that we'll be confronting and struggling with uh, as long as we live. Um, and yet at the same time, I don't think we should thereby just give up, can't do anything mm. about it, because as moral and ethical creatures, uh, we are, I think, deep down driven to make the best of our three score years and ten on this earth. Uh, and not, you know, add to the misery that's already there, to try to make the world a slightly better place. And, you know, that's kind of the frame in which we're holding this discussion now. Uh, but of course, for all three of us, it's also something that probably affects us, you know, throughout the day, every day. From the moment we wake up till the moment we fall asleep, there's some issue at work, probably. You know, what do I do? say, how do I deal with this? How do I deal with that? That is going to be continually, you know, a struggle of some kind. Sometimes we make a good call. Things work well. Mm -hmm. Other times we mm -hmm. think we're well, but it doesn't work out that way. But that's what human life is about. And I think it's the, it's this ongoing consciousness of being aware of this struggle that actually mm -hmm. serves as the kind of the, the kind of catalyst, really, that uh, enables us to refine our moral compass and hopefully in the process become better people. I, the, the idea of uncertainty, I think, is, is intriguing and important because so often we don't know what the actual consequences of our behavior will be. And, you know, B.F. Skinner talked about this, you know, in the 50s about how society is becoming so complicated that you know you can do something and you know you just don't know what the consequences will be on the other side of the world or or 20 years down the mm. road um mm. whether it's you know climate change or some you know societal mm. issue or something like that or, or even with within a family you know you say something that you think is is supportive of you know your child and they they hear it as criticism mm. 
product. Um, yeah. Again, that may have you know immediate and short term impact, or they may be chewing on that thirty years later. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the I like the idea of uncertainty, and I will be looking forward to your next book. <laughs> well, I think the the other thing that the 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 comes with the recognition of uncertainty is that we realize that every moral and ethical choice we make contains an element of risk. Mm. And in, in other words, we could call it an ethics of risk. In fact, I do sometimes call it an ethics of risk, which is to acknowledge that we can never have the kinds of moral certainties we would like. Mm. It would be so much easier if we could convince ourselves that we're right in something. And then we just sort of charge ahead and do it. But as you've pointed out, the, the reality will kick back in ways that we can't foresee and very often uh, in, have consequences we absolutely didn't want. And so how, therefore, do we uh, live morally with this uncertainty, with the fact that risk is inevitable in any kind of of moral decision we make. And I guess really what that comes down to in some senses is courage. Uh, I think you know you can only you can only you need the courage to take the risk. A lot of moral issues I find myself facing I can sometimes sort of get round or avoid by basically just going along with the, the consensus going along with what people tend to say, going along with what my Buddhism might be have told me to do, and so on and so forth. And but I find that that's also a cop out in many ways because we're not really attending to those deeper intuitions we may have, which is sort of niggling away, saying, "Well, actually, no, I don't think that's quite right." You know, I know the the Buddha might have said this, or Jesus, or Socrates, or someone, but. Deep down in this particular situation, here and now, I don't feel that works. And yet it's so much more convenient to play the good Buddhist or the good act therapist or whatever, Mm. uh, embodying, as it were, a kind of role that we've taken on for the sake of convenience, for the sake of being part of a community or a society or a religious group or whatever, rather than actually tapping deep down into the very core of of our own, you know, moral intuitions, our own sense of of how to, of how how to be good, as it were. Well, that's that's a lot more. That's a lot more work. Mm. Well, that's the trouble. That's exactly right. And unfortunately, ethics is work. And to to it's so much easier just to just to give in to the norms of mm. our society. Whereas I think really. At the heart, ethics is how we become the kind of person we aspire to be. But to lead an ethical life is not about following the Ten Commandments or the five Buddhist precepts or some list of, of, of rules in some book somewhere. To become an ethical person means to be able, in a sense, to put aside moral rules and constraints and norms of society and to have the courage and, and, and the willingness to, in a sense, find your own voice. Wow. To become the kind of person that you 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 implicitly aspire to become, mm. uh, and this I think makes ethics far more about uh, you know how do I live my life as a whole rather than how do I you know how how do I function in a morally you know, acceptable way in the society in which I live and I don't hurt people's feelings and I don't upset the boat, which is very often what we choose to do. So in that sense, I think ethics is about is, is about creating ourselves in some way. It's about stepping out of the box of conformity and convention and rules and 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 and, and really having the courage to to experiment to mm. trust you know intuitions that perhaps go against the the norms that we've been brought up with so yeah it's very much about shaping and forming oneself ethos ethics is work rooted in the greek ethos as you probably know 
an ethos that means something like character. Uh, mm. Ethics is really the formation of character. It's about the building of uh, a, a robust, but also, you know, a vulnerable sense of of, of being a particular person, and uh, seeking to somehow cultivate and develop that person that we aspire to be. It means also paying attention to those we regard highly in the world, uh, historical mm. figures, contemporary figures, taking our cues from those people we admire, who are very often not the people who have followed the rule book, mm. but people who have really taken a risk to respond to the situation as it is now rather than it was at the time of Jesus or whenever. Yeah. I mean, it is, the, it is quite, it does take quite a lot of courage to go against the grain, like mm. our sort of tribal, tribalistic tendencies and wanting to be a part of the group make mm. it very hard for us to stand out and yeah. to develop that side of us that really, like in, in acceptance and commitment therapy, we talk about our own values and they're very much a felt sense that we develop and we start and we learn about these values and what we hold true through experience. But it is a very bold mm -hmm. move to step outside what everybody else is doing or saying or thinking. It, you know, it it feels sometimes that it goes against our DNA. And like you said, often the group isn't doing that. Uh -huh. Well, by definition, the group isn't doing well, that, and uh, that's right. But it can be it can be costly. Yeah. To you know, if you're if you're part of a tribe, or if you're part of a religious sect or a political party, mm. and you're not orthodox enough, or even even within psychotherapy, if if you're not mm. if you're if you're not adhering to this particular model or school of you know, I mean, the psychoanalysts are fighting all the time about, you know, who's who's orthodox and who's, you know, mm. a, a rebel. They've been doing that for over 100 years. But even within our community, there's sort of like that sort of the purists and the, and the mm. rebels and such. But yeah, the forces are, are aligned against individuality and nonconformity. No, oh, that's absolutely right. Yes. Well, I mean, in my own life, I have stepped out of conventional existence. I did not pursue a career in, in, in England where I grew up. I went off to India. I became a Tibetan Buddhist monk and then a Zen Buddhist monk. And then when I started writing about Buddhism, I started criticizing some of the standard Buddhist beliefs like uh, mm -hmm. reincarnation and stuff like that. But I feel that, the, you know, the, that any tradition that is worth its weight is, it has any real worth to it, it has to be one that's able to embrace and tolerate inter criticism. Mm. It's mm. able to somehow give rise to people who think ahead of the founder figures, let's say, who's able to realize the tradition as a dynamic tradition, something that's not sort of fixed in stone but something that is constantly on the move because the world is constantly on the move. Mm. We're experiencing a world quite different now to the one in which the Buddha and Jesus and Socrates lived. Many of the basic issues remain the same, but the actual specific issues that we encounter would have been unimaginable for many of these people. So no matter how much we can carry from the tradition, that tradition can never tell us exactly, you know, what I have to do now. Uh, we may be attuned to our own values, and I, I agree with you, Emma. I think it's important uh, to not just think of values as things that we import from some tradition, but actually, we, as we grow up, as as, as young people, we become in, we we become aware of what really matters for us, so what really are things that we would or wouldn't do. In difficult situations, mm. we become more conscious of of what you know, is really important uh, about which mm. we really are passionate, and we seek to live by those uh, values and norms. And that often takes us into conflict uh, mm. with the society from which we came, from our family and our parents, and so forth and so on. And and in in my own case, do, you know, leading a very unconventional life has been one that's been, at times been very very difficult. It's been very challenging. 
uh, it's meant I've had to accept a lot of insecurity. I don't have, you know, bodies or institutions that can back me up. I don't have the support or didn't have the support of my family for a long time. I lived in poverty for many years. And I, but I think to put one's values to the test like that is probably the, the, the probably the best way to really strengthen them, to really mm-hmm. get yourself to be confident and, and somehow in tune with what it is you think you believe or say you believe or feel you believe. And I think, you know, we live in a world, especially in the West, <clears throat> where we have enormous privileges, enormous comforts. We're very well taken care of. And in some ways, we don't have many opportunities these days to to really test ourselves. At the moment, I'm writing about Socrates. I'm, I'm making a comparative study between the Buddha and Socrates, and primarily in terms of ethics. So how did mm. similar, how did they differ on ethical scores? And for Socrates, what's important in philosophy is not arriving at some kind of truth. What's important is constantly uh, examining and critiquing your own assumptions Mm -hmm. and views that you've inherited from your family or your religion and so Mm -hmm. on. It's all about, in a way, uh, learning how to think for yourself, learning how to live life autonomously. Buddha said the same thing. that They were contemporary, exact contemporary. So the Buddha, too, is pointing to how we need to become independent of others in our practice, in our lives. And yet, however appealing that might be on the surface, in practice, it's actually the most difficult thing in some ways. Because you need to somehow let go of so much that sort of gives you the sense of privilege and well-being and safety that our societies do at the moment still provide. That's right. Or identity. Identity, yeah, that's exactly. Identity. Uh, and that, of course, is something we cherish. It's identity, belonging, a certain assumed respect that we can garner mm. from those that we've been brought up with, our teachers, our friends, our societies, our communities. And this is obviously something that has been largely generated through our biological evolution. We are social creatures. We've adapted very well, at least from the human point of view, to this planet. And as a result, we've become very communicative animals, work very well together in groups. And so it's very easy to sort of get into a kind of a stasis, a sort of mm. a space, whether it's individually or socially or politically. And we just try to feel that when we just sort of hold on to the idea that as long as we can keep these institutions and these structures and these beliefs intact, as long as no one rocks the boat, then we'll be okay. But unfortunately, the world doesn't allow that. The world is constantly throwing new situations like climate change, for example, or injustice in the South and the North, or whatever it might be. And these do not have ready-made answers. Mm. People have strong religious belief or political belief try to keep imposing the same answers onto different situations, but that usually doesn't work. And so ethics, therefore, good and evil, as it were, is also very much a matter of the imagination. How can we imagine doing something differently? How can we imagine a society that does not just keep repeating its same mistakes, but actually Mm -hmm. opportunities for, for another way of being in this world? And I think we're at a point in our history Perhaps human beings have always been at a point in their history where, you know, the the the, the critical situations we face are becoming extreme, and somehow, individually, collectively, socially, we need to find another way of being good, and mitigating as best we can the damage that we endlessly see causing to ourselves, others, the environment, animals, whoever it might be. But yeah, that has a lot to do with identity, a lot to do with a sense of belonging, a lot to do with mm. implicit in all of that is the sense that we're right. We don't yeah. question so many of the views of our society. We just take that as given. Um, Absolutely. And we yeah. get educated in that way. I mean, listening to you, I'm just thinking, you know, so much of what we create, like even conversations with our children, 
Mm-hmm. You know, as we speak to our children or even in the education system, giving them the freedom to really question, you know, like Socrates, you know, we use Socratic questioning as part of, our, of one of our interventions. And this sort of ability to be curious and to be open to seeing a different perspective mm-hmm. and really to be willing to receive a different perspective. Mm-hmm. Is a big challenge for for most of us to be. We feel attacked. We feel criticized. We feel challenged when somebody has a different perspective. And really, it's through that education. I think it begins with our children, mm-hmm. making it safe to ask the difficult questions, to have those questions be placed upon us too, and through that, start to open to, like you're saying, a creative alternative. So thinking about this idea of of ethics and how to do things differently and really needing sort of a radical change in the way we think of things, in the way, in in this sort of paradigm that inevitably is part of our evolution, that we almost need to continue to evolve into a different way of being. It it sounds like you're suggesting that we need this really to be able to tackle some of the huge problems we have mm. and that we face today, that there's no real alternative, that going the same way we've always gone <laughs> is going to keep delivering what we currently have, which mm. is a very polarized, you know, wars, climate change, horrors. No, this is true. There is, of course, another side to this. I mean, I'm glad I didn't live 100 years ago, for example, yeah. uh, let's say in terms of dental care, or all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's easy, I think, to become preoccupied with the, with the challenges we face. And there's mm. clearly reason for that, because they're the things that are you know, of utmost importance at our time. But I think also it's worth occasionally looking back on the, you know, the course of human history and looking at some of the upsides too. I mean, I think human beings have done an incredible job in many ways. I mean, I can think of many things that they haven't done so terribly well, but the fact is we have created societies, we have created education systems. Mm. We, I mean, I live in France, and, and you know, it's an extraordinary achievement to have created a society like the French Republic uh, that I live in. You know, it's it's really quite uh, st- staggering how the whole thing works at all. I just sometimes mm. in a supermarket, and uh, you know, I just stop and I think, well, how did all this stuff get here? And how does it mm. get every single day of the year? How come every day of my life mm. I've always had enough to eat? Just mm. imagine the complexity of bringing of, of getting all of that to happen. Of, of of having education systems. I was recently at a hospital checkup, and you just get overwhelmed by how these systems of care have evolved. So, I mean, you go on and on and on, but the point is there, you know, human beings and human societies have, I think, mm. in, in good ways. That doesn't mean there is lots of places that are clearly in need of a lot more work, and including our own society too. I wouldn't dismiss that, but... There is something profoundly mysterious, I feel, about how uh, how any of this world works at all at the level of complexity that we experience. And now we have this basically, you know, you're in Singapore, mm-hmm. Chris is in Vancouver, I'm in France, we're at totally different points on the globe, and yet that doesn't prevent us from having a conversation without any glitches or technical bleeps at all. It's just perfectly doable. We don't even notice it any longer. Whereas Mm. even 20 years ago, we couldn't have had this conversation. So clearly, the world is coming together in some ways, that people are connecting with others more. The younger people, in as they grow up now, however much you berate cell phones and so on, they are exposed to a world. They are Mm. able to potentially have communication and conversation. They can learn about people from all over different parts of the globe. And um, I think that's all a positive thing. And it's something that exactly how that all happened is very difficult to explain. At some level, it seems to have almost happened by itself in a strange way. 
So that's the positive side. And I think it's helpful when we're peering into the abyss of human evil and all of the disasters that may be coming upon us in the next decades to also take stock of, you know, what we mm. have to achieve as a, as a species. I think that balances things out a bit. It maybe gives us a little bit more room for confidence, mm. a little greater trust in the human family. And that, I think, is, is, is important as well. So, And, I, and I, I think it also creates opportunities, again, to do that self-exploration around values and ethics and, and virtues. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, the teenagers who are doing all the, the TikTok messaging and stuff, and, and they're getting some very strange, you know, scary offensive stuff coming across their phones. And they have to decide, you know, they have to make a choice about, am I going to participate in this or am I going to stand up against, you know, cyberbullying or whatever it may be? So these create opportunities that people can step up and, and see them as such. Well, I'm often very impressed by the younger people I meet. I, 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 we don't have children. So apart from my nephews and nieces, of which there are quite a number, I've never really had the experience of parenting, of really having to, you know, help a young person grow into adulthood. And I think I've missed something very, you know, quite central to human experience in not having had that. But I guess, you know, you can't be a monk and a parent. So, but when I do encounter young people, and that, you know, I wish I do quite a bit now and again, I'm often very impressed by it. Uh, okay, they, they spend a lot of time glued to their phones, but when you actually start entering into a meaningful conversation with them, they're very thoughtful, they're very mm -hmm. concerned, the ones I meet mm -hmm. about the world as it is now. They're very much committed to connectivity. Obviously, a lot of mm -hmm. that is official and so forth and so on, but I think mm -hmm. we should discount the fact that these young people take these issues very seriously. Mm. And that is taking your life seriously in the end that I think is the foundation for an ethical existence. In other mm. words, not just to sort of mindlessly go along with what you've been told. And, you know, there's a lot of pushback against conventional thinking amongst the young. There always has been, I think. And perhaps yeah. we live at a time now where, you know, that sort of pushback, you know, can really build up a body of, 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 of a counterculture, as it were like we had in the 60s, for example, which at least Chris and I will remember very well. And, <laughs> uh, but it was, the, it was that period, in fact. I mean, I don't, I'm slightly getting distracted here, but one of the things for me that was really important in the life, that the, in, in what I ended up doing, was the fact that I grew up in a culture that felt that change was possible. Mm. Um, whether it was through the music, whether it was through the the examples of of, 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 of certain political and other figures, it, I grew up in an atmosphere in which, you know, I, I had a very strong, uh, you know, I, um, my feelings of what I could do with my life were really far more expanded than those mm. than would have been the case with my parents, for example. And I like to think that when I Think of a young person like Greta Thunberg or others. You know, these are young people who have taken a stand, a moral, ethical stand, and they've had an enormous impact on the world. And I like to feel that we are perhaps on the cusp of a countercultural generation that will be able perhaps to imagine more effectively, mm -hmm. perhaps we can, how to respond to some of these crises. And not just by words, but what they do, how they act, how they live, their lifestyles, all of those things. Um, so that, to me, is another positive thing. Yeah. It's so easy when you talk about good and evil to sort of just look on the evil side mm. of it. Crazy. Yes, that's what I, I was just thinking that, that we've kind of come around, you know, circle back to this. Because as I was thinking about everything that I want to change in the world and focusing on the evil of the world and how we want to sort of change the way we think and and adopt this more curious and open-minded stance. We dismiss everything. And we do, as humans, have that tendency to be very black and white. And being able to hold both, how hard that is. It's really hard for us to hold both and not want to shut the door on one or the other. 
if I'm sort of finding myself struggling with, you know, what I see as the darker sides of myself, mm-hmm. I tend not to look at the lightness and and vice versa. When I'm feeling quite positive, I don't want to look at the darkness. And and being able to hold those two does, like you're describing, open us up to more mm-hmm. possibilities because holding them both can allow us to be more creative, like you're saying in some of the sort of younger the youth of today, they're, they're, you know, thank goodness for adolescence. We've had a podcast on adolescence and the fact that they are able to hold duality, I think, much better than we can, or at least I certainly can, and are much more creative and willing to fight. No, I agree with you. And I, I think this is one of the, 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 the topics that I'm, funnily enough, I was writing about this morning. It, it's about how can we somehow stop living in a binary world? Mm. Uh, how can we somehow step out of this deeply ingrained habit to split everything into black and white, good and evil, right and wrong? And not that those distinctions are without any ground. There are. There, you know, clear, these, there are clearly two differences here. But the problem, I think, is that rather than thinking of good and evil as somehow polar opposites that are in a kind of perpetual conflict with one another, to recognize that in reality, they're really just two poles of a spectrum. And I found it helpful in particularly addressing ethical questions is to be aware of how we so easily switch or jump or hold on to one of these poles take a mm. stance and a position, and then we basically have no longer any kind of openness or capacity to hear another point of view. We're stuck into that sense of, I am right. Mm. And instead, I feel that we need to perhaps live in a way that embraces the spectrum of possibilities. In other words, to see good and evil as a bit like, not like a rainbow, it's too pretty a picture perhaps, but mm. basically a spectrum that the, the the shades from one extreme into the other. And most of our lives are probably spent somewhere in the middle band of that spectrum. It's rare that we do something that we would consider to be undeniably evil, any more than it is rare that we would do something that we consider to be you know, indisputably good. Mm. Those moments do occur, but they're exceptions rather than norm. The norm is the kind of fuzzy mid-zone where the messiness of human life takes place, where things are not binary or unambiguous. They're ambiguous. They are uncertain. They are bewildering. They're multifaceted. And that's the world that we encounter from moment to moment. We live in a world of situations that we are called to respond to, that we cannot but respond to because we are caring beings. And yet, every one of these situations has never, ever happened before, precisely in the way it's happening now, and it'll never happen again in that way. And this gives rise to what some people have called a situational ethic, an ethic that recognizes the uniqueness of each situation. And we can't there's no rule book, a Christian rule book or a Buddhist rule book, that's going to give us the answers to how to how to deal with every single one of these situations. We have to call upon our own inner values, our own uh, intuitions, our own experience, the example of others who we admire, and so forth and so on. And in the end, we have to take a risk. We have to say mm. something, to do something, and we may not be totally confident in what we're doing, but we cannot not act. That, I feel, is often the dilemma. We find ourselves in situations where it would be much more comfortable for me to not do anything, to just sort of walk away. But you know, walk, Walking away is, is, is an action. Well, walking um, would be an act, but I'm, I mean it in the sense of walking away, in the sense of ignoring the situation, right, completely but, washing my hands. Avoiding it in yeah, some way. At times, walking away might be the best thing to do. Exactly, exactly. That in, in the years that I spent, you know, working with, with kids, watching them develop cross-sectionally and longitudinally, 
you know, it it seems like people under stress become four year olds. Mm. Four year olds are working on the back from the back brains, mm. and it's very binary. It's very egocentric. Mm. It's very all or none, black and white. And when people get stressed out, they revert back to that style of thinking. Mm. And so, to be able to hold both to mm tolerate the ambiguity the uncertainty it really is an act of courage mm -hmm. and we have to be able to hold our anxieties about that lightly so that we can proceed in a positive direction but i think that it's almost a biological drive mm -hmm. to to divide the world into this and that black and white all or none mm -hmm. it, and play yeah. safe yeah I think language also reinforces it too, because we the grammar of language is again built up on things either being a or not being a, the law mm. of the excluded middle, which again reinforces the binary habit. And uh, I agree with you. I think binaryism is presumably a result of our evolution. It's provided survival advantages. And what you say about it being the default mode for say, four-year-olds makes an awful lot of sense. And you can see how, you know, I mean, I can see sometimes when I really lose it, and I do sometimes, mm. become, I've, become a bit of an, I've become an angry child again, in a way. You know, I, I, become, I have a sort of a tantrum. Of course, I don't show it, but that's basically what's going on. So all of that does all fit together rather well, but I imagine there's very few four-year-olds listening to this podcast, so <laughs> we can assume that uh, it's it's, uh, it's not uh, our demographic, not your demographic. <laughs> but it's worthwhile holding that picture in mind. I feel it's mm. also, I think, a certain humility is required of us mm. as so-called adults, as it were, to recognise that these forces from our childhood, these forces from our back brain from our evolutionary past are still very much at work in us. And in some ways, whether we talk of Mara or Satan, these are mythological ways of really talking about the legacy of our own past, our own deep past that has formed us into being the kind of creatures that we are. And in Buddhist practice, it's very much about learning to recognize Mara. The first thing is is to is to be able to sort of see this happening. And when you sit in meditation and you're trying to be nice and mind mindful and loving and so on, and you find instead that your mind is throwing up all kinds of stuff, usually which is not loving or mindful, and you have rather than thinking I can't do this, I'm a hopeless meditator, you have to say yes, this is what's happening right now. And mm. uh, that's a very, very important part, I feel, in the training in ethical awareness is radical self-acceptance. And then we come back to action and commitment therapy and other such mm -hmm. movements that are very clearly aware of the, the mm. starting point of this process is to be able uh, to radically accept the person you are, warts and everything, and don't to, and stop pretending and get into mm -hmm. therapeutic situations or contemplative experiences in which you are able to say yes uh, and unconditional yes to this is who I am. There may be parts of this I really don't like. I may even suffer from self-loathing, but this is who I am. And it's opening up that space, a, a non-reactive space of presence, of attention, of care that begins to establish within ourselves a basis from which we can then begin to think and speak and respond to the world from another position, not from a position that's driven by the back brain or habit or conditioning, but one that is grounded on a capacity to uh, accept ourselves for the kind of beings we are and, uh, and to try thereupon to establish to found another basis from which to live in this world. So it really is this 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 place upon which we can only get to. And getting to the place where we can do good means that we need to see the evil in us and make space for those parts that we don't like. Because the harder we struggle with them, 
the less creative, the less loving and good we can do in the world in a way. It's a paradox. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And I, the, the, the ways in which my writing has developed since I wrote Living with the Devil has been very much to look at that. And one way of framing it is to recognize that on the, on the one hand, we need to be able to embrace the situation we're in totally. At the, at the same time, we need to be able to let go or just let be those patterns mm. that we recognize to be destructive, to be egocentric, to be uncaring. And at the same time, to then notice, as we do when we do any kind of act of mindfulness, that mindfulness itself can be aware of all this stuff, but it's not in itself reactive. Mindfulness is a non-reactive attention. And it's that non-reactive attention that gives us the foundation for then being able to respond uh, caringly, wisely, compassionately, courageously to the world, rather than just to go along with the familiar patterning of mm -hmm. habit, conditioning, and so forth and so on. Uh, and to give some sort of framework ethics that can be reduced to some fairly basic, simple principles seems to be at least a way to begin trying to open up a space, an ethical space in our lives from which we can learn to live differently and speak differently, to relate to other people in another way. But it's hard work. I mean, it's not, this, this, is, this is not, a, this, there's no quick fix solution to any of these great issues. It's a slow, sometimes frustrating and challenging way mm. to live. And that, I think, is why it's important to find people of like mind, mm. people we can empathize with and sympathize with who seem to have share the same sorts of passions that we do. And to create community, I think, is important in this regard. And that's something that's also getting lost in our very atomized society, um, mm. the sense of, of, of these bonds of, of shared value and interest that keep communities together. Churches are largely disintegrating in Europe, at least, and nothing much is coming along to replace them. Mm. And I worry about that, I must admit. Mm. I think, uh, and again, we can celebrate the wonderful connectivity worldwide that people have access to now, but at the same time, it's always on a one-to-one -one basis as a rule. And mm. I feel without having this you know, without more consciously creating a communities, and again, ACT is a community at one level. Mm -hmm. You know, a mm -hmm. Buddhist meditation group is a community at another level. The, that also, I think, is a crucial element to somehow healing these larger yeah. systemic issues that we face as a, as a species and which, you know, other non-human forms of life suffer from as a result of our of our behavior. Absolutely. I'm yeah. mindful of the time. I think we came to a fairly good sort of concluding yeah. point. I think we did. Yeah. I think we did. Any yeah. final words to, to wrap up? I think it's been, we've covered a lot of ground and I hope we've given the listener a sort of a sense of how to negotiate mm. some of these questions without laying, our having laid on any kind of answers particularly. But hopefully, yeah. they can perhaps feel you know supported in being part of this kind of conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning into the Life's Dirty Little Secrets podcast. If you have any feedback for us or secrets for future episodes, you can email us at Life's Dirty Little Secrets podcast at gmail.com. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Life's Dirty Little Secrets or on Facebook at Life's Dirty Little Secrets podcast. We invite you to follow, rate and review us on wherever you listen to this podcast. It is the best way to get our podcast out in front of new listeners. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with more. See, See you, you then. then.